Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Gender equality and freedom of expression are fundamental values, crucial for achieving a sustainable world. These values are always being challenged, but even more now during the ongoing pandemic. Now is the time more than ever to share and learn from each other to advance gender equality in the world and in the media. Welcome to this webinar organized by Nordicom and the Department of Journalist, Media and Communication at the University of Gothenburg. My name is Maria Edstrom and I'm an associate professor and a co-editor of the book Comparing Gender and Media Equality Across the Globe. And that is a starting point for this webinar. I will be moderating the conversation and it's being recorded and will be up posted on Nordicom's website. We have a brilliant list of speakers that you can see on this slide here. And we also have a fantastic group of registered participants from over 36 countries. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. So in 1995, the United Nations had made this Beijing platform for action that placed media as one of the 12 areas that needs to be addressed if we are to achieve gender equality. But since then, there has been a slow progress of women making the news. And uh, that's part of the explanation why we started this GEM project. And I will start by uh, just giving you an idea of the, now you preferably see it, the, the discussion that we start with the GEM project, talk about that, give you some highlights from the book. Then we will have a panel discussion with all our invited guests. And uh, then in the end, we will have an open discussion, sharing good practices and how to move forward and also use the breakout rooms to get more into closer groups. But now it's Monica's time. Prof uh, Monica Yerpierre, professor, principal investigator and project leader of GEM. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to give a very brief overview of the GEM project, why we started it, what it contains, and what the, the outcome of this project has been. So the GEM project, comparing gender and media quality across the globe, is a five-year research project. It started in 2015 and ended uh, just before Christmas last year. And we have two main purposes with this project. Uh, the first one is to collect, uh, put together, and possibly also curate for the future secondary country-level data on gender equality in the news media, both with regard to content, but also to organizations. And not just collect them, but also make them accessible and open for everyone to, to, to use uh, for the future. So this open access idea is, is crucial for the whole project. Uh, but after having collected this secondary data, we also wanted to use them to, to do new and innovative research uh, to, to answer some key questions for gender and media equality. And those questions surround two main themes. One is about causes, where we try to explain why gender equality in the news varies between countries, for instance, what factors are important to promote gender equality at the level of countries. And the second aspect is more of consequences. How is gender equality in news related to social development in every other area? For instance, with regard to democracy, corruption, media freedom, social development in general. And to the left uh, on this screen, you can see a, a picture of the, the, the participants in the project. Uh, so it consists of three Swedish members, <laughs> which is the core GEM team that started the project, and also several international participants of, of which you're going to meet a few today. Uh, so this project is, is uh, somewhat different from, from many other research projects that I've been involved in, but, but it's because it has a very clear normative stance. 
And uh, we draw from many different social and normative theories in, in trying to, to, to establish the, the normative foundation for, the, for this project. Uh, we use social justice theory, human rights, uh, we draw on the capabilities approach, uh, which has been very important for, for the United Nations, for instance. And also political theory, not the least, uh, the idea of a politics of presence that was uh, originally coined by, by uh, political scientist uh, Anne Phillips. And in this normative stance, we try to have what we call a bifocal vision for a journalism of presence. <laughs> so so uh, it, it contains really two different outlooks on why this is an important thing to, to strive for. And obviously we start with, with the equality as a human rights issue, uh, where we think this uh, the promotion of, of gender equality is, is a way to expand freedom of expression and opinion to include with women, which is also very important in all the work done by the UN, UNESCO and the EU. And here we regard gender equality in and through the news media as a, as a value in and of itself. It has an intrinsic value. And in this way it, it's not necessary for women to make a difference to be included in the public sphere so women do not have to make a difference which is often the argument you hear that uh, women must contribute with something specific to 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 be allowed in 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 in, in public discourse but but from a human rights perspective this is a, it's a value in and of itself that gender equality is something we should strive for but on the other hand, we also recognize that uh, gender equality, of course, has an impact on society. Uh, gender equality in the news media influences politics, economy, the social life in, in general. And, and what we want to e examine in this project is how, what, what kind of good things or quality of other political, social, economic institutions are dependent on the media. And what are the consequences when we have a lack of gender equality in the news or in the media? So the, the outcomes of this project uh, is really three different things. Uh, first of all, we published a book just before Christmas uh, where we discuss exactly these things about causes and consequences of gender equality uh, in the news. But we also compiled this gem, we call it gem, gem data set, which Matthias will talk more about later. And uh, it, it's a data set containing data from the Global Media Monitoring Project, uh, the IWMF uh, study on, on women in the, in the news media organizations, and also a study from the European Institute for Gender Equality, which uh, uh, surveyed media organizations uh, on gender equality. And these are the main data sources that we have included in the data set. But the idea is obviously to include more data set when they become available. Uh, particularly, we, we, we would very much like to include the, the Global Media Monitoring Project when it finishes in, in 2020. So this is a data set we believe will, will grow over time. But currently it contains entries for 155 countries between 900, 1985 and 2015. And obviously all variables or data in the set uh, are not available for all countries, of course, but in total we have 155 countries. Uh, and finally, another outcome of this project is what we call the GEM index. And we saw a need of devising a simpler way of estimating the level of gender equality in the news. I mean, all these studies that have been done are fantastic and they are very comprehensive, not the least the Global Media Monitoring Project, which contains hundreds and hundreds of indicators. But just like we have seen uh, with other uh, so other aspects of social development, for instance, press freedom or gender equality in general, uh, we, we saw a need of, of devising something that is more simple to use to where you can compare countries and the level of gender equality between countries. Just like the World Press Freedom Index, for instance, uh, or the Media Freedom Index, the Global Gender Gap Index, or the Gender Inequality Index from the UNDP, uh, which contains a, a few indicators, but they are selected because they are deemed to be important and, and necessary 
to, 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 to get an estimate of, of, of the, for instance, gender equality. And we wanted this measure to be easy to use, uh, so easy that everyone actually can use it. <laughs> and uh, we also tested it extensively. And I will tell you a little bit more about that soon. So the book then, uh, you will listen in a while to, to Carolyn Byerly uh, uh, talking more about her chapter, chapter five in the book. And uh, Matthias will also talk a bit more about the, 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 the data set, not so much about his, his chapter on um, corruption. But the book contains eight chapters. Uh, they are divided in three in the main themes, which is qualities, causes, and consequences. And obviously, the causes section deals mostly with explanations, how to understand differences between countries, what factors are important to promote gender equality in the news in different countries. And the consequences part are, are more dealing with how, how does gender equality in the news relate to other forms of social development, for instance, uh, economic development and, and corruption. Uh, so one specific thing I wanted to present uh, to you is the, the GEM index, uh, which is described at length in chapter two of the book. Uh, and the idea here was, as I said, to construct a simple, applicable, reliable and robust index that can be used uh, broadly. Of course, it can tap into every single aspect of gender equality. That's not, that's not possible for, for, for such a, an easy measure. But we wanted it to be simple to, to do. And we also wanted it to be a clip applicable to all forms of news media. It shouldn't be dependent on, for instance, we're looking at television or, 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 or radio or online news. So it's a, applicable to all, to all forms of news. And it should also be statistically reliable. So it's been tested up and down <laughs> uh, with all, all, all forms of, of, of statistical measures that you can use to, 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 to estimate if, if uh, an index is a good index. And it's also been tested to be very robust. So it kind of, it's very stable, uh, even if you, if you uh, exclude certain countries or include other countries or if you look at it over time it it's kind of works so so if you're interested in that you can read about more the the, the details of it in, in in the book but but it contains six indicators uh, we're dealing with the overall presence of women as uh, new subjects but also as reporters uh, it deals with roles in, in which uh, role or, or function do, do, do women and men appear in the news. And here we look at experts and spokespersons. And finally, we also look at topics uh, in what kind of news topics are men and, and women visible. And these six indicators form, form the base index that we have used and called the GEM index. It's, we also tested, so it's actually possible to use only four indicators. <laughs> The, the presence and the roles, if you want something that is even simpler than this one, they, they work about the same, but, but this is this how we, how we devised the index. And now we're going to look at an example of this GEM index. So this is a figure from the book. Uh, and the GEM index, it, it, it can range between minus 100 and plus 100. And minus 100 is when all indicators are all men, no women for the six indicators. 100 would be, plus 100 would be if there were just women for the six indicators. And zero, which is the yellow line here in the figure, is parity or uh, it is gender equality. And as you can see from this figure, all the, the, the bars are below the zero. So there is a male surplus everywhere in the world except for the, the little dot to the, to the left, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny surplus for women, which is Bulgaria. And, and that country has consistently been showing a bit of a surplus in, in all the measures in the global media monitoring progress. So, um, but we also see that the, 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 the degree of, of inequality varies quite significantly. And, and the lighter the color here, the, the the better the situation is and the darker, of course, the, the worse the situation is. And uh, I mean, th this remains stable, uh, even if you look at, at just a smaller number of countries, or even if you 
you, you remove one of the indicators, for instance, the, the pattern is about the same. So this is very, very robust. And if we want to look at how it changes over time, you can see here uh, that it is a very slow pro progress. I mean, we have data from 1995 up until 2015. And of course, GMMP will finish in uh, the data from, from the AMMP in 2020 will, will come this year. But this, this is the figure between 2005 and 2015 uh, divided by, by, by regions. And as you can see, it's quite similar <laughs> across regions. And uh, the only region where we can see a really evident decrease in inequalities in, in Latin America, uh, which is uh, shown by, by the red bar there, the red line. Uh, but we can also see that, that the, the, the most progress was made between 2005 and 2010, and between 2010 and 15, there's been very, very little change. So it will be very, very interesting to see when the DMMP finishes uh, to see if progress has picked up again, or if it remains the same as it was in 2015. So one minute, Monica, to conclude. Yeah, I have just one more slide, so I will finish. So uh, two other takeaways from the book that I, I think are uh, present in, in many of the chapters. I mean, if you want to look at what kind of factors are important for increasing uh, gender equality in the news, obviously, women standing in society is, is a very important factor and it would be odd if it wasn't like that. So the more gender equality you have in other spheres, of course, the more gender equality you have in the news. But interestingly, it's more like economic rights and education that has an influence, not so much political rights, which I think it, it's, it's more interesting to, to note. The presence of women journalists and editors or the presence of women in the media field is extremely important as well, very strong uh, relationships with, with uh, gender equality in the news. Uh, but having said that, of course, what we can see in general for, for all that chapter is that the news media generally, they don't reflect reality when it comes to the actual progress of gender equality in societies. So there's consistently less gender equality in the news than it is in the societies. The, the news are supposed to, 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 to mirror or reflect, uh, which I believe is, is uh, one of the key takeaways from this project as a whole, that gender equality is in the news media, at least so far, has been lagging behind more progress in society than in the news. Uh, so in that, in that way, we can say that the, the news media have been more like break blocks than, than blow torches to gender equality in society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. And um, we come back to maybe more conclusions and what's more in the book in the discussion. But uh, now we will hear some examples of, uh, as you heard, we have this international group of researchers that got to choose a, a topic that they want to kind of elaborate with the GEM data set and see if they could find uh, more interesting factors. And uh, one of them who so kindly contributed to, to the book is Carolyn Bailey, professor at the Department of Communication, Culture and Media Studies, School of Communication at Howard. And so now we give the floor to you. Very much welcome. Thanks very much, Maria, and also Monica. Um, and thanks to both of you also for your leadership through this project. Um, I think those of you who followed my work know that I'm um, my passion is really with women in news and it's and the progress of women within the news industries. Um, I come to my work through uh, a journalism background, a brief journalism background, um, and um, a longer history in political activism in women's rights and civil rights on race issues. So um, I bring these together in my own research by looking at women's power and possibilities and agency within news organizations. Um, my work dates back to the, uh, in terms of academics, uh, dates uh, to the 1980s. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with the um, International Women's Media Foundation study, Global Report on the Status of Women in News Media, um, I was the principal investigator for that study. Um, I 
I authored this particular chapter with my collaborator, Catherine McGraw, who's a statistician and who I've done a number of studies with. Um, so we came to the study concerned about the balance of women in news, uh, news as news subjects in reported news. But we also wanted to know what that relationship was between the, um, the output of news and women's agency within newsrooms. And so if you look at our chapter, it's quite long and it has a lot of data in it. And I hope that you will look at it. But um, we were interested in looking at the statistical relationships using a number of data sets. Uh, we use the IWMF data, we use the GMMP data, we use the global media, the, uh, the G, uh, I said that, we used uh, varieties of media uh, democracy index and also the GGI from the World Economic Forum data to compare a lot of different statistical relationships. Um, we use both regression analysis um, and breakpoint theory, which is a, a kind of more sophisticated regression analysis in our statistical work. And we applied the critical mass theory um, which is concerned with the number of women that it might take within an organization to move them from token status into some level of influence. It's an old theory from the 1970s, right after some of the women's equality um, legislation was passed in the United States. And it's fairly controversial, but we wanted to revisit it in this particular study. Um, Cantor's original study in the 1970s concerned a single corporation in the United States. So a single company within a single nation. Um, Dalroop and some of the um, international, more international scholars have used it mostly within the political science field, looking at women's, uh, you know, how many women it takes to influence policy, for instance, in political realms. But we wanted to look at the possibility for critical mass theory being useful in a multi-nation study um, in which we used a variety of data sets. So our, both our theory and our methodological approach, we feel break more uh, new ground um, in terms of journalism, research on gender. So I won't go through all of the things we looked at and found, but I will cover three of the things that sort of stand out the first question was whether women um, in the journalism professions yield more women employed in the newsrooms. And this uh, goes back to something Monica was saying a few minute ago, minutes ago, and that yes, I mean, it's, there's a logic there, right? Uh, if you've got more women working in a particular profession, you would expect to find more within the newsrooms of that profession. And in fact, we did find that um, at a global level. <coughs> across 58 nations. Our study looked at 58 nations. Um, the second thing we looked at was whether there's a relationship between the number of women in sort of junior reporting levels and more advanced reporting positions. And yes, we did find a high correlation, statistical correlation. But the meaning in that isn't exactly clear. In other words, does it, who influences whom? higher positions mean that they're going to hire or be influential in bringing more women in at the junior level positions? Or does it mean that having more women at the junior level positions provide a pool uh, and a pipeline to women in higher positions? And, um, and I'll say more about that in just a minute and where I think it needs to go. And um, the third thing I wanna raise is the number of women, is the number of women in leadership roles in a newsroom associated with the amount of news about women? And this has been a quintessential question that has come up for many decades. Uh, we debated it, for instance, when we were doing the global report study about the need to do this kind of research. And we found um, a very high, strong correlation between the number of women in top management roles and the amount of news about women um, in those same countries. And also, uh, we found a strong statistical relationship between um, women in reporting roles and the number of women in um, news stories. We use the critical mass and breakpoint analysis uh, well in this particular query. 
And we found that the critical mass of women was found between 40 and 45%. This puts it higher than the 30% figure than earlier researchers had found, but it's what worked for us because you could see a clear break point at different places on the regression line. So um, these kinds of studies, one of the things they do when you're using data that a lot of other people have gathered um, is that they tend to be hypothesis building exercises. In other words, we now have some better ideas about where future research needs to go in looking at relationships between women in women's position in the newsroom and the amount of news about women in those same organizations across countries. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carolyn. And now we move uh, to uh, the, the last chapter in the book. And uh, now it's Sarah Macharia. And uh, you are not only an a, a, a independent investigator researcher here, you are also the head of uh, the GMP studies. But now it's your research hat that you put on when you talk about your findings. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, my chapter is a product of the convergence of a long-standing research interest on women, women's economic participation in global South context, particularly, and my current engagement in gender and media, which is my other hat. Um, the study was an opportunity to explore news media's treatment of those who are most marginalized in the mainstream economic system. I was curious about the relationship between gender inequality in economic and business news and gender inequality in the lived economic experience. So I had three major research questions. The first was, can gender inequality in the subjects and sources in economic news be correlated to gender inequality in economic participation? Secondly, does the gender gap in authority voices, that is as experts and spokespersons in economic news match the gender gap in the skilled workforce? And then thirdly, do national policies on women's economic rights and freedoms contribute to variations in women's visibility in economic news? Now, going into the study, I was aware of the huge gender gaps in economic news content, but I wanted to know the extent to which these gaps reflected reality as a first step to understanding the gender blind spots in this media genre and topic. Uh, in the chapter, I discussed the issues that I had to confront to build a sub data set on measures of women's economic participation from global databases such as the ILO's key indicators of the labor market. In the chapter, I employed bivariate correlation and multiple regression analysis to explore this relationship. My sample is composed of 135 countries with data points ranging from 93 to 275 across the period 2000 to 2015. On this slide, um, women are at least 40% of the counted economically active population in all, all world regions with the exception of the Middle East, but they are present in economic news content as only 20% of subjects and sources overall. The patterns of underrepresentation are repeated in varying degrees across the globe, seen by the, very, the varying shades, shades of orange to red and white uh, in the chart. There is a substantial gap between women's real world economic activity and their presence in the news about the economy in all regions of the world. The gap is smallest in the Middle East and largest in Africa. A temporal analysis reveals fractional increases in women's presence in economic news stories across time, regression in some cases, even as their involvement in economic activity has grown. On the next slide, I compared clusters of countries based on variations in development as rated on UNDP's Human Development Index. I was curious as to whether the correlation results would be different between, on one hand, high and very high human development nations, and on the other hand, low to medium human development nations. In this slide, we see a positive relationship, similar to many of the other correlations that I looked at, but it is feeble and not proportional. As women's share in professional occupations increases by one point, women's visibility as experts and spokespersons, these are, these are authority voices in the news, increases even less by uh, less than half a point. Given the links that have been made between gender equality and policy, 
I also examined whether women's visibility in economic news had any relation to national policies on women's rights and freedoms in economic life, taken as indicators of the legal framework that sustains the opportunities uh, for women's economic participation. Finally, I employed multiple linear regression to examine the extent to which gender inequality in economic news content may be predicted by gender inequality in economic realities. I have some takeaways. Clearly, the gender inequality in news media content reflects something other than gender inequality in the broad labor force part participation indicators in the tenure of waged jobs uh, in skilled employment or management positions. Rather than the impeccable accuracy and impartiality prescribed for this genre of news journalism, what appears instead is a relative erasure and invisibilization and silencing of women. Finally, gender transformative approaches to tackling inequality are all, all the rage now in international development. If we believe that the media are a vehicle through which gender norms in society are transmitted, are shaped and reinforced, then gaining a more intricate understanding of how the norms are embodied in content and how these in turn limit progress towards equality would be a first step to exposing the media dimensions of gender transformative action. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, I believe that both these two chapters uh, are examples also of what can happen if you use our uh, GEM data set with other data sets. And uh, now it's time for uh, Matthias uh, to uh, not talk about his chapter, but uh, talk about uh, what is this data set uh, and, uh, and how you can use it. Uh, so the floor is yours. Yes, I'm Matthias Ferdig and it's responsible for the work of compiling the GEM data sets. And first of all, I would like to say something about the aim and what we see as our mission when it comes to collecting and merging together different secondary data sources and second also say something about uh, our data sets and what we hope for the future uh, and if we start the basic argument we put forward in our project uh, for compiling secondary data is that if we are to understand if and how gender equality in the media stimulates reform and contributes to other positive outcomes in society we must carry out more extensive systematic and comparative analysis uh, of gender and journalism and we have also seen two examples of the, uh, this kind of, of uh, research now in, in Carolyn and Bailey and Sarah Macarena's uh, presentations. Uh, but we also uh, believe that large scale comparative analysis are necessary, both in explaining the variations in gender representation in the media and in understanding the role of the media in shaping essential social outcomes. And in order to do so, and to make generalizations possible and to test hypotheses and so on, we need good, valid and reliable data. And when it comes to, to uh, gender and media equality data, just as when it comes to other kinds of uh, data within social science area, the data is scattered uh, literally around the world and thus way too difficult to get access to in order to be able to accomplish systematic research and so on. And secondly, the data on gender and media equality are for the most part kept separate from other theoretically relevant types of data, such as, uh, for example, consequences. Uh, if a country has a high gender and media equality, what do it get in terms of an increased human well being and so on and so forth? And the second type of data we want to assemble the data on causes, how to achieve and how to get gender and media equality. And the aim with our gen data set has been to identify and bring together these three types of, of interrelated data into one uh, database, but also to make it easy as possible for people who want to do studies within this field to, to be able to do so easily. And a freely accessible database where the quality of the data is, is highlighted and made ready for easy use, so to say. You can change slide. And right now, uh, the version one of the two data sets is uh, publicly accessible to download free access and, and contains 373 variables. 
And as Monica said, it covers a total of 155 nations with data from 1995 to 2015. And the uh, GEM cross-sectional time series data sets consist of 3,255 country years observations. And the GEM cross-sectional data sets, so it's actually two data sets, but it's the same data, but it's organized in two different ways. So the cross-sectional data sets also covers 155 nations, but consist of the latest available data, uh, so to speak. And what I hope is that our data will be used to increase knowledge about gender equality in, in the media and in the long run contribute to uh, making this world uh, a little bit more equal, uh, so to say. And, and a really good data set with high quality, free for anyone who wants to access it. And that is uh, what I hope, uh, yeah, you are, that is listening now today, but also that you will spread the, the word about the data set, because the more people who use the GEM data set, the more users, the more perspectives on media quality, the more developed and multifaceted state of knowledge. Uh, it's easy as that. And then Maria used to say also that we measure what we treasure, and that is uh, it's, it's a good uh, way of thinking of it. So, so please feel free to, to download it and, and, and spread it. And the thing is that there is a lack of reliable data within this area and more continuous data collection on equality and not least media equality is needed. Uh, and the plan for the future is that the James data set will live on and of course to be updated and continuously refilled with new and even better data in the future. Uh, and of course, everything is a matter of financing and that is where we are right now actually to, to, to find uh, money for, for doing this kind of work. And I have put uh, quite a lot of effort in developing routines for doing quality checks uh, off uh, and working with structuring the data to make future merge a little bit easier. Uh, another part of our plan for the future is to e increase the accessibility uh, and to make it easier uh, to use our data in terms of tutorials, workshops and ready to use compilation of specific indicators and so on and so forth. But that is where we are right now. So, so yeah, uh, I hope you, uh, this little speech has, uh, yeah. <laughs> Promotional speech. Yeah, yes. a little bit of promotion, <laughs> but it's not, uh, I mean, it's free, free access, but at the yes. same time, I think this is important. So yes. feel free to download it. Yes. Thank but, you very uh, much. Yeah. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the purpose of the, our project is kind of twofold in that sense that of course we want media scholar to advance you know, the, the, the analysis of media issues, but also by creating this data set in a manner that people who are outside the media field will also understand that media is an important component in achieving gender equality. So, so it's both within the media field, but also outside, because uh, we have the, had this feeling during this project that the media issues tend to be forgotten in the, in the global agendas. Uh, so now we're going into the second phase where we have invited uh, a number of people to kind of reflect upon this uh, data set. And, and the first person to speak is uh, Sarah Macharia again with another hat, because now she, she, she will talk as the, the org uh, organizer of the 2020 GMMP that was actually quite difficult uh, to um, to collect data this time due to the ongoing pandemic. So the floor is yours again, Sarah. How is it going with the GMMP 2020? And Well, uh, thank you, Maria. Um, well, yeah, so wearing my hat as coordinator of the GMMP, I'll talk about the future of the GMMP within the context of the GEM project. Uh, for those who are not aware what the GMMP is, it is many things rolled in one. Um, and I'll quote, uh, a number, a couple of people. First, Margaret Gallagher, who is a feminist communication researcher and one of the pi pioneers and authors of the first global reports. She called the GMMP as one of the most far reaching collective enterprises of the global women's movement. And I'll quote another uh, participant, uh, Dr. Midori Suzuki, who uh, was a participant in the first GMMP 1995 and a great proponent of critical media literacy in Japan. 
She called the GMMP as a giant workshop where the participants are active audiences from all over the world. And those who joined the GMMP realized for the first time that they are all seriously thinking about the same media issues at the same time. Oh, simply we could call the GMMP as the largest and longest running research and advocacy initiative for gender equality in and through the news media. It seeks to bring news media accountability into the struggle for gender justice, equality, and women's rights. Every five years since 1995, the GMMP's volunteer network of activists, researchers, students, and media professionals have applied a standard methodology and coding instruments to take the pulse of gender in their local news media and following this process with actions to influence uh, in the various spaces in which they are located. And at this point, I'd like to thank all the participants in this webinar who uh, played a role in collecting data for the 2020 GMMP and previous GMMPs before that. Um, it's more than data gathering and it is a broad a process of participation that brings critical media literacy uh, and solidarity on a global scale, building bridges across various stakeholders. But let me focus here on the data building dimension of the GMMP. As Matthias said, it was an enormous uh, process to put together the database. The meta database has made it possible to uh, bring together, to systematize, and to make publicly available GMMP data collected since 1995. Resources allowing, as Matthias and, uh, and others have, have said, uh, data from the latest edition of the GMMP carried out late last year, uh, that was in September, and that involved uh, uh, just under 120 countries at the height of the pandemic uh, will be collected and it will be integrated into the data set. Currently, we are in the process of writing the global, the regional and national reports uh, with an expected launch date uh, in June. Um, as a global coordinator of the last three GMMP editions, that is in 2020, 2015, and, and 2010, I have become increasingly concerned about the contradictions in the process. On the one hand, the process is complicity with the exploitation of primarily women's labor, and on the other hand, the intention to produce results that will ultimately drive gender, greater gender equality. Let's talk about the GEM database. Now, the empirical data increase the possibility to successfully argue for the centrality of media in struggles to advance gender equality and secure women's rights. The new development paradigm Agenda 2030 or the SDGs have displaced media as a thematic area in the richness in, in which it was present in the Beijing Platform for Action, Section J. In fact, in Section J, media monitoring is present as a standalone strategic, strategic action and it is only through this transnational, this type of transnational mobilizing and monitoring effort that the database can be sustained and expanded to provide the evidence we need to support policy proposals and other actions. Um, someone has said that journalism as a profession runs the risk of being cut out of the media value chain if public interest and freedom of expression are not brought into the equation. Uh, public engagement with serious stories is happening increasingly outside mainstream media in alternative spaces. And these are spaces where audiences can hear others similar to them, see their perspectives validated and issues important to them uh, discussed. Uh, the GMMP began with a relatively uncomplicated but important focus on the presence of women and men in the news media, counting who appeared, who was heard, uh, who was spoken of in the news in order to determine empirically whether the arguments on myths and underrepresentation of women could be supported by the evidence. And this uh, just completed uh, GMMP 2020 showed us that it is indeed possible to collect more nuanced data going beyond the binary treatment of gender and integrating intersectional concerns. I think there's a real risk to sustainability of this kind of work over the long term. Is the tendency to take for granted that the GMMP will happen, whether the resources are present or not. And stakeholders of those who are simply interested in the results want to know what are the results without considering how we get there. And how will this important tool that is the GEM database remain alive and up to date without the support that the network needs to continue collecting the data? Uh, well, there has been a move actually in the, in the past maybe couple of years 
there's been a move towards automation of media monitoring on simple indicators in some newsrooms, but it is not an answer to the challenge posed by transnational, transcultural, multilingual global content. And I will stop here. Good. <laughs> a lot of uh, food for thought there. And uh, as we said, we, you can use the chat if you have questions uh, to the speakers who want to comment something. I think it's quite uh, silent there still, but we'll, we'll move on to uh, IWMF, who also granted us the possibility to include their data from the global newsroom study that um, Caroline talked about where she was a PI. So very much welcome Elisa Ali Munoz, who is the executive director of IWMF, International Women's Media Foundation. And what are your thoughts about uh, our project and the possibility to, to use uh, more comparative uh, research on uh, gender and media? Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here with you and to see uh, so many familiar faces from the time that we did our original research and so happy that it has contributed to the longevity of this global research. And I'm sure, as Caroline mentioned, um, the need to have co com comparable data across countries is really critical. And I think that we continue to see uh, discrete studies being produced around the world um, which I, is obviously extremely valuable, but um, we were always hoping to push for an agreed upon methodology that would make these uh, discrete studies a value add um, that could lead to a more global evaluation of gender equity in the news media. So I, I hope that people will still work towards a globally agreed to methodology um, so that when these extremely valuable studies that are being done um, are done, they can fit into these different pieces of a bigger picture, um, because I think that's still a need. Um, I'm gonna go in a slightly different direction and talk about the direction that the IWMF has gone in recently, because um, as many of you I'm sure are well aware, global research is extremely difficult to fund. And um, I think that that's a huge hindrance to our ability to do this kind of work. But another thing that is happening is um, this attitude of, well, we're counting the numbers, and so now we have the data. And, and I think it's a need to look a little bit deeper about exactly what is it that you're counting. Because if you're just talking about the number of women in the news media, where are these women? What are the kinds of assignments they're getting? Like there's such a need to go so much deeper. And one of the things that the IWMF is focusing on when we're talking about going deeper is trying to figure out what is driving women out of the news media. Like, why are they not succeeding? Um, and one of the uh, areas that we're focusing on is safety. So doing more research on what are the issues that are keeping women out of the news media? Why are they leaving? When are they leaving? And um, I don't necessarily believe that that's what's keeping them out of higher levels of the industry, but it certainly contributes to it. And so we're focusing uh, particularly on online violence. And as um, was mentioned, I think this um, need to have equal representation in the news media is directly tied to press freedom. And what are the issues that are keeping women's voices out of the news media and framing that as a press freedom issue, I think is really critical because for the last 30 years framing it as a gender equity issue hasn't resulted in much movement of the needle. So I, I'm really looking at reframing these questions to press freedom issues and to uh, approaching it from a much more intersectional position and looking at who are the voices, who are, what are the women's voices that are being left out, who is particularly being left out of the conversation and out of the industry. And I think that we're just in a time in, in our society where those conversations are having more traction. And I find myself sounding more like a marketing person trying to figure out what, where the spaghetti is going to stick to fit to make people care about this issue. And I think that where I have seen a little bit more traction is this press freedom approach, this intersectional approach, and um, this um, legitimacy of the news media 
approach and and really the necessity of having a represented a representational media in order for the media to be considered viable and legitimate so i'll just leave it there i know it's a slightly off topic but i i think it's um i think it's important to think about what what's going to make people care about this issue more thank you elisa no i absolutely don't think it's off topic because it's all interconnected and and uh, I mean, the number is just the baseline, right? And, and I think the problem with, with uh, I mean, you, you're supposed to collect sex desegregated data on a national level. And if, if state parties were doing that or commissioning someone to do it, we wouldn't need these voluntary studies. And then we could start working on those issues that you are talking about. So they're absolutely um, uh, interconnected. But thank you very much. And now I give the word to Agneta Söderberg Jakobsson, Senior Advisor and Gender Expert in, at Fuyo Media Institute. So uh, you have your few minutes now to say what you think of our data set and how you're planning on using it and what you did. And uh, if you're not, we'll say it yourself, but you actually contribute with uh, supporting four countries involvement in the GMP. I will tell you a little bit about that. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm really also really happy to be here and to see all of you, some, some known faces and many new faces. Um, I've actually, I think I've been invited to give the perspective from an implementing organization. So that is what I will tr try to do, how to tell how the GEM project, how we can use it to strengthen and advance the, work, the media development work that we do. But I've also been a good student, so I've prepared two slides that I, that I will use. Um, just a second, I will share them with you. Um, yes. so do you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, because First of all, I need to tell you a little bit about what for you, what we do, what for your media institute is for you to understand actually how we can also implement and how we can use uh, this new knowledge from the GEM project. So I'll just tell you a little bit uh, in short what for your media institute is. Uh, it's an independent institute at the Public Linnaeus University in Sweden. We are currently active in 20 countries uh, in uh, Eastern Europe. South and Southeast Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa. I also want to tell you that we're not an academic institution. For we started up as a mid-career trading institute for Swedish journalists in the 1970s and has since developed into a global media development organization. And what do we do? Uh, we aim to strengthen free, professional and independent journalists in Sweden and worldwide. We do capacity building for organizations, institutions, media outlets, and media professionals. And so far we have built the capacity of more than 50,000 media professionals and the content producers. And our key areas are media viability, business models, professionalization, investigative journalists, and gender equality and inclusion in the media. And we do this in partnerships with national and regional partners for lasting change. And in some countries, we work with partners that are specialized in gender and media equality. Uh, I have a few examples here on the next slide. To the right, you see Gender and Media Connect from Zimbabwe. And to the left, you see uh, Myanmar Women's Journalist Society, MWJS, uh, in Myanmar. Both participated in GMMP 2020, and also our partners in Cambodia and Russia participated for the first time in, in, in GMPP in 2020, all of them as national coordinators. So thanks to our partners, some of the blank spots uh, that were previously there have now been covered. But still, there's still some way to go because we know that data are still missing from I think at least 40% of, of, of all UN member countries. Um, so for Fourier Media Institute as an implementing organization, what can we make of the GMN project? First and foremost, I want to say that this project is a great contribution overall to the discussion on how, how gender equality and news media interact. 
and interrelate. We have now very, we have very, we have had very little knowledge about how gender equality in the media actually relate to gender equality, to the quality of democracy and the general status of women in society. So, but for FOIO, for FOIO as an organization, how can we use this new knowledge and uh, the data set? We can use it to argue for change. One of the key findings from this research is the fact that the world is often more gender equal than what we see in the news. And then I'm not talking about the obvious fact that women make up half of the population and are still grossly underrepresented in news content, but rather the fact that this research shows that women are represented to a higher degree, for example, in politics and economics than in the society. Uh, and compared to what we see in the news media. I think you all recognize the excuse from the media that the gender imbalance in the news content has to do with lack of female experts or women sources in, in general who can comment on events. Here, the GEM research can help us and strengthen the arguments for gender balance in news media content. I also see endless possibilities uh, to use this data set to inspire change processes. One example uh, would be in journalism training. Here, the GEM project and the book could be used to module gender equality into curricula on journalism and, and communication. And of course, also for more research in different fields. Here, we can introduce the, this research to our partners uh, and actors in like uh, University of Rwanda. We also work with University of Somalia, with Wits University in South, in, in, in South Africa and Stockholm School of Economics in Riga and others. The GEM index could also be used as a practical tool to measure gender equality in the news content in many other ways, as I see it. Journalist students could use it for local monitoring exercises. Media organizations, associations could use it to follow up on performance when it comes to gender balance in the news and so on. Some countries or groups might also choose to use it on a yearly basis to get data also for the years in between the GMMP editions. Thirdly, the, the GEM research will help us to act for change. It will help us to develop our theory of change and, de and develop our programming. What kind of interventions should we engage in to make real and lasting change? And what actors need to be involved in this change processes? And last but not least, the data set and the GEM index give us all new tools to measure and follow progress. What trends can be seen and how will things evolve? Soon there will be new data from the GMMP 2020 to be put into the data set and more will come. Uh, just to end with, I just want to say that I think one of the most important thing now is to keep the data set alive and to make use of it for new research. And to do so, their uh, funding needs to be secured, but I think that is probably for another discussion. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Agneta. I mean, uh, we are really happy that you see all these possible uses with the data set as we are hoping and we, we consider kind of the book and the data set as, you know, day zero and then we will see what uh, develops uh, from that. And um, now we move uh, to Johannesburg and uh, Tarisai. Uh, Nyamweda, who is a communication officer for social change, uh, communication uh, for social change manager, that's the correct, at Gender Links. And uh, we invited you because uh, you are, you know, uh, one of the organizations that have been, been around for so long now, uh, you celebrated 20 years, and you have your own, I mean, you take part in the GMP, but you also do your own studies. So uh, the floor is yours, Tarisa. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Maria, for, for inviting us to be part of this discussion and to talk about and to just forward processes really on an issue that we have, um, that has really grounded our work for the past 20 years and um, here in Southern Africa. And uh, I think congratulations on this great piece of work that we are all going to tap into and borrow from 
as we move forward in our gender and media work. So just to give you a brief um, outline or background of who Gender Links is. Um, so Gender Links is a women's rights organization that is based in Southern Africa. And uh, it started off really as a gender and media organization in 2001, focusing on issues to do with gender and media research, um, training of journalists, advocacy work, and some policy work, um, gender and media policy work with media houses across the region, including in public media. Um, and um, the work that we have done really around research uh, is that we have coordinated, I think, the largest and the longest longitudinal research in the region on gender equality in the news since 2003, and the latest one was done in 2020. And we've been tracking progress of women's um, representation and portrayal in, in, in news media. And really our work um, through this project builds on the Global Media Monitoring Project, and it's really informed by the Global Media Monitoring Project in terms of its methodology, the parameters, and the way we do the research. Um, so the Gender and Media Progress Study, which we call the GMPS, um, it's, it's a barometer to, to check the progress that uh, newsrooms within the Southern African region have made towards um, gender equality. And we also use this to hold the media in our region accountable and raise awareness around the importance of having equal representation, um, uh, portrayal, participation of women um, in the media. So really this work, this data that we, we continue to gather since 2003, um, we've used it as, as our evidence to, as an our evidence base to push forward our advocates and strengthen media practice. And as we also go back to train the journalists um, in the media that we work with, we have used this research findings to then um, show the media, the gaps that are there um, as we do our training. So in terms of how we can use um, um, the GEM data sets, the GEM index in our own work, um, really it's around, um, you can see this piece of work influencing our own work, um, the research that we do, not only in the gender and media progress study, which is done every five years, but in all in the in, in the media monitoring that we the continuous media monitoring that we do on various topics um, um, around we do monitoring on, on, on the economic reporting, we, we do or we just recently did um, monitoring on women's leadership and political participation, which are things that are included in, in, in the book. So we see this influencing uh, this piece, uh, this piece of work influencing our own research, not only the, the five-year research, but the regular research that we continue to, to, to do. And having this um, data, we will also be able to share and um, the, this data to be part of the, 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 the data set that can be that can be used on the various topics um, that we look at. And really it's a good practice that can that can shape. Um, that can shape our work and also other like-minded organizations that we work with here in, in the region. And as uh, we, 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 we can use this work to call this GEMS data set to collaborate with, um, with our partners um, so that we can be able to get to a place where we have data that is, for example, comparable and, and um, have agreed to methodologies and parameters to to some of the research that we, we have. I saw in the book, we talked about a lot about the, the challenge in having data that is comparable um, across countries. And I think with this cross-national approach that is taken through this book, uh, this, through this book we can also have cross-national, cross-regional collaborations um, as we, and we pull resources together uh, where we can find where we can find resources, um, even though we know in this sector right now there's very limited funding to to do things like media research, um, um, let alone media advocacy work. So I think the cross national collaborations um, will really come in handy as and we use this uh, the gem data sets to to come and try and come up with. Um, um, comparable data that we can use to then influence our own advocates and training work. And then I think lastly, um, one important thing uh, to mention is around us maybe using this GEM data set um, uh, and indices through working with the journalism and media studies departments that we work with. 
um, in Southern Africa who have been um, really the anchor of our gender media progress study and who we worked with as well in doing the gender media monitoring project and um, trying to find ways to integrate this in, in, in teaching and learning uh, as in many, in many instances, we have tried to work with journalists in the media studies departments and um, as they revise their curricula and those are maybe entry points that we could use and where they revise their curricula to use this GEM data set um, and the index, of course, um, because these people, most of the most of the institutions that we work with or the departments of journalism that we work with have actual um, gender and media classes. And this can be integrated within teaching and learning within these gender media classes, um, whether it can be part of practical um, things that they do for, for, for within the, the, the course on gender and media. Um, and really this can help inform the curricula um, when, when, when the time comes for the departments to, to revise the, the, their teaching and learning and the curricula within these departments. Uh, I think, I think that's about it. Yeah. Thank you, Tarisai. And uh, maybe you could close your slide and we open up for Luba Kasova, who we invited because parallel when we were doing or publishing our study, um, you were commissioned to do a, a large study as well, not with so many countries, but with six uh, English speaking countries. So we thought it'd be really interesting to hear your reflections with your kind of um, similar uh, uh, study, but still another, yet another study. So Luba Kasova, you're a director and co-founder of Adi and with Adi Kasova to this audience strategy, AKS. Is that how you say it or do you say AKS? AKS, AKS, AKS. 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 yes, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Maria, and thank you very much for inviting me to, um, uh, to your uh, seminar, which I find fascinating, and I really appreciate the gigantic effort that you've put in creating the database and the index, and uh, creating an opportunity for comparable um, findings and for more systematic uh, research to be done globally, which, as uh, Matthias earlier outlined, is incredibly difficult given how sporadic the data is often so thank you this will I'm sure advance the field tremendously and I will be uh, sure to dig into your data set in due course I also really enjoyed reading the uh, sorry not reading but skimming through the chapters and and finding some synergies with what uh, we found in our report but before I do uh, that uh, uh, Maria you asked me just very quickly to, to talk about the background of the studies that we published concurrently with yours and also about myself. So um, I, uh, I'm the director and co-founder in ACAS, um, which is an audience strategy consultancy aimed to uh, help purpose-led organization to serve their audiences better. Um, you can see some of the organizations that we're working with uh, and, and the boxes in red highlight those that I personally have worked uh, with on media related projects um, uh, and uh, I, I am a social scientist academically but I've spent vast majority of my career uh, doing a research either within media organization or as a consultant helping organization understand their audiences uh, before starting my consultancy I headed up the audiences team for BBC journalism so uh, I'm a practitioner in the sense that my passion is to use data uh, insights and findings to actually help journalists do their uh, work better and this is, uh, 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 and I used these skills when writing the reports that I'm about to talk to you very briefly about now. So last year, um, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation commissioned the missing perspectives of women in news first uh, in support of the uh, Gender Equality Forum convened by the UN Women. However, as we start, and, and as you uh, said, Maria, we looked at six countries 
uh, India, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, the UK and US. Um, um, and as we started working and uh, trying to find resource um, sources that were comparable across all the countries, the pandemic kicked off. Therefore, we uh, uh, it was felt that it's incredibly important to actually capture uh, that that potentially biggest story of our lifetime and how women are represented and also portrayed uh, uh, in news during the pandemics. So this is the COVID report. The missing perspectives of women in news focuses more on the representation rather than portrayal of women across the whole value chain uh, uh, of news. Um, so, um, very briefly to uh, to outline what the key findings are and the synergies that we found with your findings in, in your report. Firstly, news is produced mainly by men, featuring more men and is consumed more by men, which is similar to what you found. Women's share of quoted voice is marginalized, certainly in those six countries, and we found that there hasn't been any progress made in the last uh, uh, decade, if not more very similar to your finding is in fact i was um uh, it was really heartening to see that you too found that there was additional uh, like we did there is additional bias that news media overlays onto already structurally biased society towards uh, uh, men. Um, we found also that um, uh, gender equality polemic is uh, virtually absent from the news through content analysis of millions of stories. And uh, actually, I should say that we used thousands of sources, including IWMF's global reports and Caroline Biley's The Palgrave International Hand book as well as the GMMP. So we've used the uh, similar sources and many, many more as well. Um, uh, also, um, uh, one thing that uh, I'm incredibly passionate about is we looked at the patriarchal norms uh, and they um, and and we operate still very much in the global south, the countries from the global south and the global north uh, within a framework of patriar strong patriarchal norms that uh, essentially underpin all the problems that, that we're talking about. However, there are many uh, solutions. So, so um, just before I move on, there were many, many synergies uh, with, with, the, with your work. Um, and where I see your databases and indices helping is for us collectively to start building an understanding how change happens, how, what needs to happen for us to reach gender equality news, and what are the factors that the barriers that keep that from, uh, keep gender equality from progressing, which seems to have happened in the 21st century. Very little progress has been made, especially in the second part. And we look uh, in the reports, um, we see um, change happening on three levels, system level factors, which are incredibly important that's regulatory change political change social change and norms and that underpins everything but also at organizational level uh, in terms of news leadership change and newsroom changes uh new um beats uh, and uh, uh, everything that had ha culture within the organization and then individual level factors so the behavioral of, of uh, journalists specifically and that's where behavioral science come into comes into to play and only when all these three groups of factors work together can we hope for change to be sustainable uh, uh, and and if one of those levels works in the opposite direction then we're seeing regression uh, uh, potentially but using this newly uh, a database that you've created an index to try and understand and, and become more sophisticated in understanding how change happens would be would be a dream come true uh, uh, and finally, just to say um, another uh, couple of things about the reports that uh, uh, we produced, the missing perspective. So there are a lot of uh, recommendations, 50 re recommendations in the news report and 21 in the uh, COVID report. And in the news report, in fact, I have generated a gender parity news checklist. All those recommendations are generated by uh, reviewing the reports of non-government organizations 
recommendations new, um, that work on this, academic recommendations and my own recommendations based on the experience of working with journalists. And this is a really practical tool that journalists and organizations could use to advance either strategically to change their narratives. Uh, as Elisa was saying, it's really important that we, we start talking about different ways of why it's important to have gender parity rather than stick to just one uh, rights-based angle, uh, but also at very operational level, what it is that at uh, the level of news gathering and news outputs, organizations and journalists need to do to improve uh, women's representation, but also their portrayal in the news. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luba. Uh, now we've been going almost one hour and a half and we still have a, a little more time. And the idea was to have a now a joint discussion. So you might close your slide, Luba. Yes. Uh, and um, still silence in the chat. I don't know if that is because you're too tired or if you actually are just stunned by what you've heard. But um, I would like to catch up on some like trends. I, I, I would like to start with um, what uh, Elisa talked about, uh, that you need um, globally agreed uh, methodology, because I think that's where, you know, the civil society uh, or consultants or researchers really, I mean, people m might have been working too much in their own boxes. Uh, what, uh, what do you say about that, Monica, who, you know, about methodology and collecting data. Uh, was that a question for me? Yeah. Yes, that was a question for you. Yeah, global yeah, 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 I was I was thinking about that as well when when um, when I heard the, the discussion here. And I, I think that to, to some extent, I, I don't think we realize how important the GMMP is. I mean, we know it's important, but I think it's it, it's it's, it's actually unique in every sense of the way, even if you look at other uh, data sets and, and co data collections about the content of journalism, there's nothing to compare it with. I mean, no, it's a, such a fantastic and formidable <laughs> effort to, to collect this kind of data uh, uh, and also do it over time. I mean, there, there isn't... Um, there's nothing to compare it with. And, and I also think that the GMMP, in, in the sense that it's been gone for, for such a long time, it kind of sets the standard also for, for what kind of indicators should we use, what are important, uh, and how can we measure them. And, and if we follow the GMMP's work over time, you can also see that it's becoming more and more sophisticated and more and more clear about methodology. And, and uh, these, of course, are, are the main reasons that we draw so heavily on the DMMP in, in our book, because it's such a fantastic data set. And I'm a bit surprised, well, not maybe surprised, but I, I found it interesting that the only data set which contains content data over time for so many countries, anywhere, it's about gender. I mean, in a way, it's fantastic. <laughs> because we don't have that for, for any other, other issues. And I think also we can use the GMMP data for, for many other things, actually, if we wanted to. And it could have a broad applicability to, to journalism studies and journalism research, uh, not, not only when you dis, uh, are interested in, in, in gender. So I think that, um, I don't know if that was a quest answer to your question, but that was a reflection on the, the need for having having a, a systematic way of measuring things. And I think that the GMMP here, at least with regards to content, sets the standard for how it's, how it's done. Uh, and and we, we draw on that for the book. Yeah. And I think, I think uh, uh, what is a problem is that, uh, no critique for you, Luba, with six countries, but when you have very few countries, now you have chosen the strategic countries, but you, if you want to do global comparison, we said we, we would like to have at least 30 countries, we said, uh, to, do, to have worked on the same methodology in order to be included in the data set. So that was one thing that you can find a lot of studies that are eight to 10 countries or something like that. But then the other thing is that uh, a lot of um, like uh, journalist studies are like expert interviews. Uh, 
and not actually collecting the, the factual uh, information. And so you, so you rely on national experts and, and that, that could be a, a problem, of course, as well. But um, I was thinking, what do you think, Caroline, about this, uh, the systematic work that is needed? A global agreed, agreed methodology. Well, um, well, I don't think, first of all, there's a single methodology that, um, that we need. I think we need a combination of methods. I think what Elise is talking about is best gathered through interviews um, to gather people's stories. Um, I say that because, because I'm aware, for instance, women, we don't know. It's sort of like trying to track things that have disappeared already. Trying to track people who have left the industry is very difficult. It's like um, so another kind of research I've been doing on women in violence. We don't know all of the violence that women have experienced in their, relation, in their work lives as journalists because many of them have left already. So first of all, how do we find the people who've left and how do we interview them to find out the factors that were involved in it? I think that's very tricky and it involves developing networks and snowballing sort of techniques um, as far as methods goes. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, tracking things on a longitudinal basis, um, that's what makes the GMNP so incredibly important. And also the fact that more countries seem to be involved all the time. So we have a better and better sense of comparison from one nation and one region to another. Um, it's very difficult to gather data across nations on gender and media because of the financing problem, because of the fact that um, researchers don't all have the same methodologies, because of all sorts of things. Uh, we were doing the global report study. We ran into all sorts of things we hadn't encountered or thought we would encounter like weather. People couldn't deliver their data because the bridges were out and they couldn't get their questionnaires to the mail and they didn't have any electronic means to transmit them. So we had to wait two weeks for data from some countries. There was an earthquake in Chile, which interrupted the data gathering in that country. Um, and so we've, you know, gathering data um, is problematic in all sorts of, un, you know, un, predictable ways when you're working cross-culturally. But I think the fact that we now have research networks, those research networks are integrated with civil society networks, like the group that uh, Luba is working with, and that Albana Shala is working with in the Netherlands, for instance, um, that we have organizations that provide a, an infrastructure for us. These are all positive things that suggest we have all the means right now to really work together to move forward on our cross-cultural research. Yes, and I, when you talk about the struggle of collecting data, I thought of Agneta, who's also uh, working closely with Myanmar. And I mean, how I remember we talked to you said like, I mean, we collected data, you know, in September, and now everything has changed. Could you say something about that? You know, the the, the current situation for the your colleagues uh, involved in? Yes, uh, I could do that. I mean, as you all know, the situation is, is, is terrible in Myanmar and our partner in Myanmar Women's Journalist Society. They did this uh, great job and pioneering and they were part of, of, of the GMMP in, in September. And now uh, the, the situation has changed completely. So, um, uh, they even think it's, it's, it's no use of, of presenting the data. No one will, will be interested and, and the, the media landscape has changed totally. So it's, it's not really relevant, but we still um, discuss this and agreed that it's still important to write up the, the national report to, to, to share it among a, a, a smaller uh, group of, of actors uh, because it is also, and it's also important Hopefully things will get better uh, at some point to have it as a reference, um, uh, a reference point also to be able to follow the development because a lot of things had happened before the coup. Um, we actually did a 
gender monitoring that was based on the GMMP uh, two or three years ago that showed that there was 16% women in, in the news media. So this was, that was like a pre-exercise. And now um, I will not announce numbers <laughs> because it's still secret, but uh, I mean, we will do, a, a, they will do a national report, but it, it can of course not be used as it was meant to. It's very sad. That's I, not, do, of, I do of course, think you could, sad use, thing. Uh, you could think of it as a starting point because mm -hmm. one of the main findings in our, our uh, book is of course, all the blank spots where you have no data on, they're not part of the uh, gender gap index. They're not part of the freedom of expression mm -hmm. indexes or they're not part of the GMMP. And, and all these blank spots where you see that gender equality, freedom of expression, all these things are interconnected and they're not part of the, of the data. So, I mean, uh, you contributed putting Myanmar uh, on the map, so to speak, and then we'll see how it will develop. And, and um, if you don't have a, a baseline, you don't know kind of uh, where project pro progress takes place, I think. So in mm. that sense, it's really important. But I think many of you also touch upon this, uh, the, the global uh, news culture that we call it in the, in the book yeah, and how, how can you explain that, that society is more gender equal than the media and why is media in so many cases lagging behind? And it's a, of course a complex issue, but I think uh, e even more that the 2020 data will be interesting if you combine it with the increase of autocratic uh, states and, and the situation uh, uh, for democracy in many parts of the world, if, if, if you can interconnect uh, the GMP data with uh, the VDM data that comes. Uh, I, I think Mathias, Mathias, your intention is to update all the the, the indicators, right? Not only the GMP. No, I will update all the indicators that are in the data set right now. But also, if uh, I get good suggestions of new indicators, uh, I will include them as well. So it's an open question, so to speak. So yeah. Good, because uh, um, tackling social norms, the UNDP report, of course, uh, would be very interesting. The, that also Luba Kasova uses in her report. Uh, would you like to say something, Luba? That's exactly what I was going to raise. So the, the the thing that I have um, that I keep thinking about is that we have to find a way to include to include portrayal how women are portrayed in the news as part of the index, as you and UNDP's um, a social norms index um, is based on the World Value Survey data, which has seventy countries, so it meets your threshold, and also it's a good proxy, in my view, but it's something for you to test. It's a good proxy for whether the women will be portrayed as more empowered or less empowered in the news. And for example, if that was to, to be taken into account in the case of Bulgaria, and I have very strong view about Bulgaria because I'm Bulgarian, um, then Bulgaria is not going to be the only positive outlier. Uh, Bulgaria's position is really going to go down and it should go down because the way women are written about in Bulgaria is not favorable at all. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say. And, and then I would like to recommend Monica's chapters uh, on modernity, chapter four, uh, which uh, where, where she kind of investigated some of these things, but I agree that we need to, you know, have the updated um, data set. Uh, another topic just came up also has been this, uh, the role of education has been discussed by several, but I think uh, um, that we also need to kind of uh, reflect uh, in smaller groups. So now I suggest that Julia start uh, uh, opening up, up some breakout rooms for about you know 15 minutes or something so so we can uh, kind of reflect and think about how can we move things forward what are the crucial issues now based on what you heard here today and and your own contributions from where you stand uh, in the room so to speak so so uh, yes and of course if you have to leave you leave uh, like brenda murphy thank you for being here uh gmp coordinator of malta uh, and uh, <laughs> uh so uh see you in a smaller room uh for 50 minutes and then we come back to the big room so i think most of us are back the ones who are not uh, attending other things uh, 
So maybe some, someone want to raise their voice and reflect on things. I can just report from my group that we talk about good practices and sharing good practices. And we said that we will uh, add some links on the list that we um, will send out afterwards. For example, the AGME project, the European project that has a global outreach where you have some examples of good practices with Claudia Padovano who's recently joined here. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, send us some links as well. <laughs> she's also a chapter author on policy. She couldn't attend before, but now she's here. So I leave it at that and give the floor to someone else who want to reflect on something. Just open your mic and speak. I don't want to talk too much, but I just want to tie us back to practical impacts. Uh, during our session, I was asking, who is using this research and how can we find a bridge to really affect change in media organizations um, in a different way? Because for the last 30 years, well, they haven't been buying what we've been selling. So um, we need to think more about creating that bridge um, to make real change uh, in, in the industry and make our case better and different. Uh, good point, yeah. I think you're completely right, uh, but I also think someone else tried to say something. Yes. Can I come in? It's Anjata. I just wanted sure. to comment on, on what Eliza said. Lisa said, uh, I mean, that's in, in, in our case or for you, we like just one example, like in Russia, uh, the National Coordinator for the GMMP, our partner, is called Andri Media. Andri Media. It's actually a network of, of regional media organizations. Uh, and they actually were now the national coordinator and were doing this, uh, this gender monitoring. So that, that's an example of if you can engage that kind of, of organizations that are actually, the, it's a member organization of, of regional and local media outlets in Russia. If you can reach them and engage them uh, in, in GMMP or in other uh, similar projects, because they will be as an ambassador for, for the project and, and that, that it will, so, so, so to say, it will safeguard, uh, hopefully, the engagement of, of the industry as such. It's just one example. I came to think of the 1998 project who speaks on television. Some of you oldies might be familiar with that project, but was the public service television in, in Europe who, who did their own study because at that point, uh, uh, they said that no one from the outside can understand the, the, the newsrooms or the, the, the editorial room. So we have to do the study ourselves. Uh, and, and, um, and I think that's really taps into what Elisa was saying that, you know, how, how do we sell and, and, and that a lot of newsrooms seem, seem to think that they are so unique in a sense that, you know, no, no one from the outside can really understand. Them. <laughs> uh, but I also think that they're more open because it's a, it's a new situation. You have this crisis of business models the legitimacy of the of the newsrooms and everything that you have to kind of let, step up a bit in the newsroom and then maybe you, you are more willing to to listen to to uh, outsiders or research um can i say something yes. sure. <laughs> hi i'm josephine from the swedish gender equality agency and i was in a group with romina from malta and Karin Bengtsson from uh, the Swedish government. And we were talking about a lot of things, but we were talking about online hate speech, for example, which um, we are working a bit on at the, the agency. Uh, we're talk we were talking about the importance of qualitative research uh, in addition to, to quantitative research, um, how are women portrayed and why. Um, and also, I would like to comment uh, on uh, the, the question about how to change the media. Um, uh, I think a lot of it has to come from within, within the media. I'm, um, currently, I'm, I'm performing interviews with uh, 
Swedish publishers and um, journalism schools uh, as part of the Swedish uh, GMMP report. And yesterday I spoke to the, the sports section of the Swedish um, um, broadcasting company. And they have done a huge job on creating um, gender parity in their sports news. And they have won a lot of um, awards for this. And, and just recently, I think it was just a couple of days ago, they released a, a handbook on how to achieve uh, um, gender equal sports news together with EB, EBU. Mm. So uh, yeah, that was just a, a thought. Yes, I think the organizations like EBU uh, collected you know, good practices in this report, all things being equal and also uh, one IFRA has done a couple of reports now, so so I'm kind of a little bit more positive about the the the, the industry realizing that this is a crucial thing for for, for the future. And uh, some of those reports are included in the introductory chapter of the book, so you can find the links and stuff there. Uh, but I, I I do think we have to keep in mind this. Uh, uh, kind of lack of, of, of memory also that, you know, what, what, how was the situation in 1995 when you finally got the, for the first time media was in focus uh, as section J in the Beijing platform for action. Uh, and where are we now in 2021 and where will we be in 10 years? Uh, will, it, will we go forward or will something else happen? Um, and that's for the future, of course, to, <laughs> Uh, to tell, but uh, I think uh, Monica as a project manager and or, or project leader and a PI would you like to say something before we close this uh, session. Uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to thank you for coming here and participating and, and uh, being interested in, in, in the work that we have done. Uh, and I really hope uh, that the, there will be a continuation of this. I mean, as we have discussed anyway, this is more of a starting point than a end point, hopefully, and that we can can continue to 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 curate and, and update this this data set and and that it will find its its uses uh, across across the globe for, for different reasons in the education in more research because there are so many things that you can do with this data set. I mean, the, the eight chapters in the book, they are just uh, good examples of what you can do, but, but you can do much more mm -hmm. if you're a, you're a researcher, but, but also that it will find its way to, to, to into the curriculum and uh, maybe also to, to teach statistics, for instance. I think that's a very good way of, of learning uh, how to measure things and how to make a cross tape sectional analysis and things like that so so um thank you for, for, for this and then we have like a final um, question in the uh, in in the chat uh, that i uh, it's about if we know if if there are more women today let's see if i can find it here uh, da, 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 yeah if there are more women today are hindered from participating in the media as journalists uh, today and and the the simple answer to that we don't have enough uh, data on those kind of things. And it would have been great if, if someone would have done those timelines of uh, the qualitative studies, of course, as well. But I mean, in the, in the framework of uh, uh, safety for journalism and harassment, all this, there, there's a large number of uh, studies going on. And uh, all of you who are part of that and know that could you know, maybe send them in and we uh, will send it with this email that we hope say that you will get after this, uh, taking part of this. Uh, so now I would just like to thank Nordicom and Julia Romel, not only for publishing the book Nordicom, but uh, for organizing this event that brought us together and uh, to talk about, you know, the, the lack of achievements or the achievements for women in the news media and how to move forward. And uh, I would like to end with this uh, general quote about if you want to walk fast, walk alone, but if you want to walk far, walk together. And I think we walked some step together today. So thank you very much, everyone who participated.